Hi Peter, thank you very much for joining us in our very first um, Thought Leader series as part of the Resource Revolution. Pleasure. Where we're sort of setting the scene around the, um, the sort of shift that's taking place from a sort of a linear to circular economy. Now, you have such a wealth of experience in the industry. Um, I'm just curious to sort of know, how, how has this sort of come about? How have we sort of moved from this linear towards this sort of circular economy that's emerging? Well, as you, I think you know, Nick, I'm, a, I'm an economist and I like to bit, sort of break these big issues down to little ones. But uh, effectively, the way I see it is that, first of all, obviously, you've got the economic triggers. Uh, as far as the UK is concerned, we've now seen uh, nigh on 15 years of swinging increases in the landfill tax. So that's effectively bolted the cheap exit door. Uh, secondly, in terms of absolutely contemporaneous uh, events, or indeed going forward over the next year or so, if uh, Mervyn King's statements around print running the printing presses, being a cynic, I think that governments always get out of debt problems by inflation. Uh, inflation in the UK means falling pound, so resources as imports are going to go up in cost. So that's right. going to act as a, an immediate sort of spur over the next few years, if indeed we can believe uh, that the Bank of England will actually carry forward that. Uh, more prosaically, of course, most people say it's about global population. Uh, it's incredible, really. I mean, I know I'm getting on a bit, but it's staggering to think that uh, there are now almost five times more people on the planet than there were when I was born. Uh, just after the Second World War. So uh, I don't think it's about population. For me, the big driver is the bourgeoisification, if you like, the middle classes right. in the BRIC countries, Brazil, India, China. Uh, those emergent middle classes are the ones with the big resource footprints. And uh, they are entering the consumer market at a rate of 300 million a year. Wow. That's the entire population of the original EU6, every year, year after year. So demand, if you like, put, put simply. And I guess there's, uh, there's also this issue of um, resource security. Uh, it's, it's about supply and demand uh, in terms of particular uh, heavy metals. Sure. You're seeing this at the upper end of the spectrum, rare earth metals first, but gradually it'll extend right the way down to the lowly biomass. So a mixture of factors, but on a global scale, uh, then pretty fundamental. Well, we're sort of at the sort of very early stages of where we're sort of seeing the circular econo economy emerging, because it's, as you say, there's all these pressures that are taking place externally and, and um, also internally. What do you see as sort of being the impact on the waste industry? Uh, as your surveys have identified, there are, it, it's, it's no sort of even picture. There's a, a very broad church out there. Sectorally, we're seeing clear differentiation. And I think that uh, the recent events around the food industry and beef are going to get mm. people thinking. Because it's clear that in terms of uh, the waste industry, we're probably a lot more closer to this revolution than many other sectors. That's A, because the nature of the people in the sector tends to be those with experience of many uh, sectoral chains. Waste is waste regardless of where it comes from, but we've been long used to understanding that material flows differ from both type of arising, CNI municipal, and indeed within those sectors from different social groups and within different industry sectors. So. Uh, the waste industry is further down the road. I think there's a lot of tokenism being talked in sectoral supply chains. But uh, at the moment, I'm not seeing a fast enough sort of integration between the leading FTSE 100s and or FTSE 250 companies that want to engage in this in food, electronics, electricals. Yeah. Uh, and the specialist services, the waste industry is still organised around disposal options right. rather than around product options. 
And I think that that's impeding this sort of clutch-like mechanism that we need to drive investment and partner partnerships. Well, it's you've sort of picked up on that point about it being a mixed picture. And I mean, the research that you sort of mentioned, we've we've sort of we've looked at sort of attitudes among um, businesses and also amongst um, waste management companies. And it's interesting because the businesses seem to have woken up and and be much more down the road and have em embraced the sort of the idea of where we're moving towards a circular economy. But the waste management companies, they seem to sort of not really woken up to this challenge. Does this sort of, a, does this sort of alarm you? What, you know, what do you feel? Well, the, yeah, it's a, there's a number of reasons for that, of course, in, insofar as th this, in, in the waste sector as we understand it, it's been manifested in uh, threats to the so-called big six, uh, who one would normally, in most industry sectors, expect to be the drivers. It's the big companies that will actually reinvest in the new uh, forward-thinking systems. In our industry, because the uh, barriers mm. to entry are fairly low, what you've got is a plethora of smaller people that almost like little, um, it would be wrong to describe them as piranhas, but effectively okay. uh, they're going to graze and feed in niche segments uh, because they're more nimble, they're more alert, or they often come from supply chains rather than the conventional waste sector. Uh, secondly, you've seen the entry of uh, very big companies from end market processes, particularly in packaging, of course, around cardboard, uh, to a lesser extent in plastics, which is fragmented, and glass. Uh, uh, and so the, the big companies have effectively been fighting a rearguard action. They found it very difficult to reinvest in these systems. I'm, from what I've seen of them, though, I think they're very alert to it. They're just looking for ways in which they can capitalise on that going forward. I mean, because you, you, you touched earlier about sort of... Um sort of traditional disposal and treatment routes and there is this danger from what we've um, uncovered from research that we've done that end of life streams could start, start sorry, sidestepping these uh, traditional disposal routes. Um, what do you think the waste management companies need to do to, to make sure that they don't get left behind? If you just look at the back end processes, uh, my advice to them, and I have given it to a number of the uh, board level members of these companies is, is, is fairly simple and that's that as far as the technology is concerned think about three simple precepts. If you as an industry are, whether you're charging or being given uh, a fee, but uh, if you're being given gigajoules of material then the first thing you have to do is make sure that whether that's recycling, composting, mm -hmm. energy, heat, uh, transport fuels as an end product make sure that if somebody gives you a million gigajoules of that so-called waste that you can realize that uh, at levels of 60, 70, 80 percent realizable saleable outputs and if you do that you'll be in a stronger commercial position than the guys down the road that generally at the moment are, are managing 20, 30, 40 percent. The second thing you have to do is to sell that gigajoule whether it's as I say as recyclate or energy at the highest possible price right. and the third thing because as I said I'm a cynic is do the whole thing the logistics the transition and fuel preparation and the conversion within the lowest possible carbon footprint because I'm pretty sure that over the next 10 years with or without Osborne in charge of the Treasury then governments will realize that taxing carbon is a good way to go when people are railing at paying it through petrol taxes or yeah. through income taxes. So low carbon footprint, high conversion efficiency, and sell those gigajoules for the biggest bang for the buck. And if you do that, you will make more money. And if you make more money, you can then bid the price of waste down uh, as a gate fee and manage that transition to a business that has security of feedstock and security of back-end exits, which is what the, yes. the circular economy is all about. If you don't succeed in that, then be prepared either to sell the business or just see the business shrink. Right. I mean, you, you, you've touched really about sort of this, the innovation that's sort of, sort of emerging out of this sort of, um, circular economy that people are talking more and more about. And obviously, technology is going to be fundamental to this. Um, 
but you've also said that we've got a sort of a government at the moment that's not creating sort of um, a, a stable market in a sense. There's a lot of uncertainty out there, and, and finance is very difficult to uh. to come by to support a lot of these sort of technologies that are only we're now starting to see. Do you do you think the waste industry is sort of is well equipped to deal with this sort of emerging sort of circular economy? What, what does it need? Well, I can only count up to three, and, and I gave you three reasons on what makes a good technology uh, earlier. The other three that I'd bring into this discussion is economics, technology, and then the sort of what I call the socio-political box, and that's what your question's about. The technology is easy, because most of the stuff to do this is out there. Right. The fact is, it's not affordable. So government has a part process in the economics. If you ask me what I think government could do to accelerate this process, then um, on a proactive front, I think that they could grip some of these supply chains and really get moving with producer responsibility. Okay. Now, these advanced companies that are in the FTSE 250 league, uh, and notably the FTSE 100 league, that are driving down this route, the light bulb's gone on that mm -hmm. because of the falling pound and resource scarcity, particularly around electronics and metals, that it's maybe perhaps cheaper to retrieve last month's platinum or yes. last year's platinum working in conjunction with the waste industry uh, than it is to uh, go and keep mining it in the Congo. And I think we're at the very start of that process but cold-blooded economics are driving procurement managers or strategic thinkers in these companies to a realisation that an efficient waste retrieval system in this country could actually be cheaper in the world of 2025 yes. when there are another two billion people out there all wanting to live like the inhabitants of Epsom or Isha <laughs> or Bristol uh, suburbs. That's the first point. The second point is government's got to get a grip. We are not, in my book, effectively governed. There's no strategic thinking. Yes. The numpties in government, there are numpties there. They think that waste is solved because we've got all these incinerators coming along. Uh, they will actually sort the problem out. Uh, we indeed, as a sector, are talking about overcapacity. Well, fine. But I think that a lot of these uh, incineration plants now, if uh, they may or may not work. Intuitively, I don't think this solution is about large, consolidated, three, mm -hmm. four, five hundred thousand ton processing options. It's an uncertain world. <clears throat> We're talking about sectoral foci. We're talking about material-specific streams. That, to me, smacks of uh, uh, much smaller uh, types of operations much greater information technology application around specific streams and uh, some of the public money that's being put into these contracts is in danger of being utterly utterly wasted and that right. should be a risk for government. I know it's very difficult to predict but considering the fact that we don't have a clear steer from government where do you see the state of affairs say in five years time in terms of how the circular economy has developed in this country? Well it, it'll be it would be market economics. Uh, in the case of energy, then energy, once you start getting brownouts, once the, uh, and indeed it's reflected some of the work that I personally, of course, have got involved in, but I'm not here to talk about that at length. But uh, basically that's why when, uh, I, uh, from about 2005, uh, I was involved in talking to the major energy users about the need for co-located plants. That's why I did the work for Advantage West Midlands and produced that report, suggesting that in fact, rather than just find places to put waste management facilities as part of the circular economy, you look at those places that uh, needed lots of recyclate mm. or lots of gas or heat or electricity and surveyed them as potential sites where you might co-locate the infrastructure to give them what they want to drive down their raw material feedstock because ultimately we all then even in 2005 mm -hmm. understood that politically and economically the availability of oil yes. gas and so on against this backdrop of rising middle classes and consumption globally 
could only head north in real t price terms. So this is all part of that co-location agenda. It's all part of this partnering between waste companies, logistics operations, and technology providers, and indeed the people wanting the electricity. So in energy, brownouts and shortages for the half-hourly interruptibles running cold stores or RDCs, docks, airports that are threatened by the fact that we don't have enough kilowatts in the, in the uh, uh, juice in the network are the very places where I'd be starting. Okay. And in recycling, you've seen that with the way that the package, certain cardboard reprocessors are now integrating up the supply chain to take that cardboard away from the conventional waste companies. I think that's terrific. It's turbulence, it's market opportunity, change. You know, the monopolies and oligopolies are not good for anybody because no. they, they stifle thinking, they, start, they, they basically restrain development. This is a fantastic area of opportunity and it's demonstrated by the large number of entrants that yeah. we're seeing coming into what used to be called the waste sector. Well, it's been fascinating speaking to you, Peter. Thank you very As much ever, for your time. A pleasure.